So I've had a couple of guys on my channel asking me to show them how I make steam valves. And I thought to myself, you know what, that'll actually make such a cool video. But I'm not going to do it on my lathe. And the reason being is I've modified my lathe. I've done a few things to it and I've added a couple of things. So it wouldn't be fair showing my methods on a lathe that I've modified because then you don't know if it's the method that works or the lathe. So what I did was I went to my favorite tool supplier on North Machinery Mart here in South Africa and I said to them, you know what, give me your cheapest lathe, well lend me your cheapest lathe because I'm not going to keep it, I'm going to give it back and I will make the most complicated steam valve and clap you don't really get more complicated than that other than the steam injectors and the pressure gauges but let's let's leave it for steam valves and clacks and i said i will take this lathe and i will make those components using this lathe unmodified i'm not going to change anything on the lathe if i run into a problem i'm just going to have to work with what i have in front of me which makes a video very interesting i wonder how this is going to work but look let's just unbox it clean the lathe and i'll show you guys a very quick setup and then we go from there. Alright, so this isn't going to be one of these unboxing videos that the guys do. This is more of a how to do something video. But I, had, I do want to take everything out of the box and just show you guys sort of what you all get with this lathe. So we know what we're working with. The first box of the... Oh, here's the gears and... Oh, this is, this is cool. Huh. So, having a spring on the chuck key is such a good idea because you don't leave the chuck key in the chuck. And if that, that is, of course, one of the most dangerous things on a lathe because when you start up a lathe with a chuck key in the chuck, it just shoots out and you can actually really, really hurt someone. When I was giving training a couple of years back, what I did was I took springs and I actually brought springs to the training class. It was their lathes, of course. And I put the spring over the chuck keys and I just tacked it on three places. The thing is, you can tell a person like a hundred times, don't leave the chuck key in the chuck. But look, you forget, shit happens. And the chuck key, you know, flings out and someone gets hurt. So I think all beginner lathes should come with the spring on the chuck key. I think this is such a good idea. I was not expecting this. That's very, very cool. All right, so we got gears, and they're all metal gears, which is really cool. So these are all the these are all the gears for thread cutting. Um, oh, there's a whole lot of uh, Allen keys in there. Here's the internal chuck keys. Our oh, spare fuse. All right, there's quite a few nice knickknacks in there. So I'll put that to one side because we're going to need some of that. Let's see what's under polystyrene number one. Ah. And there's the lathe. Oh, there's oil and stuff. So obviously when they when they ship it, they they spray like a greasy oil on, which we're gonna wipe off now. But what a beautiful lathe. It is actually fantastic. Hey, this is such a beautiful lathe. It's tiny. I'm used to a much bigger lathe. This is going to be really interesting working on such a small lathe. All right, so let me take this out and we'll clean it up a little bit and then I'll do one or two setups and then we'll start machining and see what this little guy can do. So if you're planning on buying a new lathe, Invariably, it comes with a type of grease that they put over the machine and they actually spray it over all the machine surfaces. And it's a combination between a grease and an oil. It's quite, it's quite tough. Thing is, that needs to come off if you want to do some proper machining. So the whole lathe needs to be cleaned. And what I normally do is I take off all of the sliders and I actually take that grease off of the sliders and I put nice oil in and I reassemble everything. So a clack valve consists of a body, a ball that sits on a seat, and that's where all the magic happens, and then a cap that closes the whole system off. Now, the design of these things is actually quite important because 
If the ball is too large, then the pressure from the boiler creates too much force onto the seat, and then your pump or injector needs to work harder. The flow area around the ball and the lift of the ball is also incredibly important in the design. If that's not done right for the system that the clack is used in, so in other words, this, the boiler or the loco that you're using it in, you, you don't get good performance of the system. So it is incredibly important that the design is correct. A good example would be a injector would need a different amount of ball lift than a axle pump or a crosshead pump. So the top cap will have different clearance to the ball. All of these design considerations need to be taken into account when designing these things. So one of the fascinating things about these clacks is to get one off the shelf that matches perfectly to your build is actually quite difficult. It actually makes sense to build these clacks for your loco. Then you know it's designed correctly. But let's have a look at how to build them rather than to to design them because that's not the focus of the video. So let's have a look at building one of these clacks. I'm not going to show you every single step of building one of these clacks. The reason being is the video will become long and tedious and I'm going to get bored making it. But what I do want to do is I'm going to show you specific steps to prove that the lathe is capable of building one of these clacks. And the idea is, you buy one of these lathes, if you don't have a lot of space, it'll go into a cupboard, and you need to know that this lathe can do everything required to make a fully functioning, perfect steam clack. The best component in the clack is the bottom ball seating with the coupling at the bottom. This is where most people fall short when making clacks. And if you've ever stood on the side of a track and you hear a clack making a noise, that's typically the same noise that you would get from sort of pipes in a household environment, that water hammer, you know that that bottom component isn't made correctly. And that age old story of taking a brass bar or a copper bar and smacking the ball onto the seat to get a good seal is absolute nonsense. You should never need to do that when making a clack. But look, I'll get to that a little bit later when I get to that part of the machining process. For now, let's just show what this lathe is capable of doing. So simple machining, removing material at the end before cutting the thread is relatively simple and setting up the tool height, you just need to do that properly and you'll get really, really good cuts. The thread cutting on this lathe is actually very, very easy. In fact, I would say it's easier than doing it on a larger lathe because there's no inertia from the machine or from all the components in the headstock. You can actually machine a cut, so you cut your screw thread, and when you turn the motor off to zero, the machine stops dead. And then you reverse it, or you pull the tool back, and you reverse it, and you can go back at the same speed. It's actually very easy to do that on this lathe, and I recommend for beginners, a lathe like this is, makes thread cutting a lot easier than on a larger lathe. And once you've done all of that and you've drilled the hole, and I'm going to get back to that hole in a minute. Uh, that hole is really, really important. But let me get back to that hole in a minute. Then finally, you measure enough material and you part it off. This is another interesting thing on this lathe. I use quite a large or a wide parting off tool. And I, was, I actually wanted to see if the lathe could handle it. A wide tool rel relates to sort of much higher forces talking on the, on, the, on the headstock assembly. And this is typically what I would use on my lar larger lathe. And surprisingly, this lathe did pretty good. It parted off this part with no issues whatsoever. All I had to do is I needed to lock the taper slide and that, that part came off cleanly. Okay, so we've just machined this and I have parted it off and ready for the next operation. Now you would have seen me drill the hole and this is the, the seating face for the ball and this is where it all falls apart. One thing you need to understand is you cannot drill a round hole. A two flute drill in a three jaw chuck will always make a three leaf clover hole. It will never make a perfect round hole. And the problem is, if you, put a, if you drill the hole and you put a reamer in from this side, you're just going to get a hole that is, again, not round. Because it's going to bite in on one of the teeth and so forth. And besides, 
the chances of having the exact right reamer for that hole that is commercially available is pretty much zero. And that hole relative to the ball needs to be the correct size. So we need to make another plan. And it's actually very, very simple. That hole that's drilled there is one size under. So I need a 3.8 hole for a 5mm ball, so I drilled it 3.6 or 3.7. But now we can't put a reamer on this side because the reamer will, will typically wander and it again won't make a round hole. So here's the trick and this makes my clack valves work every time. And you don't get that hammer and you don't get an unstable ball on a bad seating. What you do is you flip it around and you tackle it from this side. Now typically what I do is I make a tool maker's reamer or some people call it a deep bit cutter, same thing. And what this does is now you have a surface that rests on the hole 360 degrees. But again, if you put it in from this side, it's going to wander. So if you flip it around and you put it in from that side, by the time you get to your seating surface, you can see the hole is fully, or the reamer is fully supported by the hole, and you end up with a perfect, perfect hole. Okay, so now that we're flipping the part around to get a perfect seating for the ball, we're creating a whole lot of other issues. Holding this becomes a problem. If you, you don't want to clamp on the screw thread and you don't want to clamp on one or two millimeter shoulder to machine the screw thread for the coupling at the back end. And also, even though the reamer will find the center of this hole from the back end and correct itself, you do want sort of middle and you do want it to be center. Otherwise, you're going to get a little bit of drift and that hole is going to end up pushing to one side and becoming oval. And there's a real easy trick to hold this. All you do is you make yourself a little mandrel like this, which has got the correct screw thread and pitch, and that gets screwed into there, and chucked like so. So while I finish off the machining on this part, let me just mention one or two things about the stainless steel ball. I've seen a number of these balls fail. And the reason is, when you go buy a stainless steel ball, you never know quite what you're getting. The best material for this ball is a Austinitic 316 grade. But the problem is, when you go and pick up your balls from a bearing supply shop or whatever, you never know if the guy has sort of taken a ball off of another shelf and put it in the wrong batch. So do yourself a favor and carry a magnet, the type of magnet that you get from the motor. And if the ball sticks to that magnet, then it's not suitable for a clack. Now you might argue that 304 Austinetic is just as good and it is slightly magnetic. So 304 will stick to a magnet, but that stickiness to the magnet is delta ferrite and that is what causes the bit corrosion. So any ball that sticks to a magnet is probably not suitable <laughs> so this might offend sensitive viewers, but the easiest way to check that you've got a good seating on your ball is the tongue test. So what you do is you put the, the union against your tongue and you pull vacuum and the ball needs to stay on the seat. Then you know you've got a fantastically good seal. Steam valves are a little bit easier to make than clacks, and all it is really is a body that's typically made out of brass. You have a stainless steel spindle that will close a hole, so you'll have an inlet and an outlet, and then you'll have a gland or a compression um, sort of system at the top that will seal up against the gland and the spindle so that you don't get leakage or bypass there. And then typically you would have a nice handle that engages on a square that you can open and close the valve from the back head. Now I'm going to concentrate on the stainless steel spindle and the machining is relatively simple. It's just a couple of sort of facing and machining operations. There's a little bit of screw thread and then typically what I do is right at the end that little square at the back end I just file with the file and then that fits into the handle. 
I principally have two types of stainless steel spindles. I have a 60 degree end tip spindle that I use for my blowers and any other steam valve that I need to control the steam into some other sort of object. Then I have a 90 degree which is more aggressive steam opening and closing and this I use for the blowdowns and very specifically for the injectors because you want to open the injectors and close them very quickly so that they pick up properly. But okay, back to the machining. There really is nothing to machine the, the spindles and this little lathe did pretty well machining the stainless steel. Incidentally, the stainless steel that I used was just from an old Bodum. We drink a lot of coffee and they tend to break. So the Bodum, the stainless steel mesh at the bottom of the Bodum is very good for making uh, filters for inside your tender. And that little sort of stainless steel shaft in the middle is a beautiful free machining stainless steel that I use for all of my spindles. So it's quite easy to use, easy to machine, well worth not paying nothing for it. So again, testing these steam valves on for the faint-hearted, so sensitive viewers might be offended. But basically what you do is you open the valve and if you blow, you can hear the air coming through. But if you close the valve so that the seat is closed, Nothing gets through. Then you know you've got a good valve. So, fair warning, I picked this up at one of the large branches in Gauteng and it is horrific going to one of their stores. They are beautiful. They are machines that are just Fantastic. And you walk down the aisles and you're like, I want that, I want that, I want that, I want that. It is like being a kid in a candy store. Getting a beautiful lathe from them is... <laughs> yeah. And that's all I can say. Just like that. Well worth the trip. Have a look. See what they have. Mosey around the corridors and have a look at all the tooling that they have available. And the guys are always eager to help you, so that's cool. But be warned, you're probably going to buy some.